diamonds are a girl's best friend. Unless that girl happens to be an eight-year-old in an Angolan mine. We'll let that sit for a second. But what is a diamond? And why are they so expensive? Out of all of the gemstones in the world, why does humanity put such an emphasis on diamonds? What is a blood diamond? What are the uses for diamonds? We'll be discussing those topics and more today. This is episode 5 in my History of Birthstone series, in which we dive into the classic list of birthstones. But before we go any further, please consider liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing. For more gem, mineral, and fossil content, and if you haven't yet, check out my Moonyfine Mineral of the Month Club. For $10 USD a month, plus shipping, you'll receive a curated mineral modest write-up, specimen tag, entry into a giveaway each month, and as it grows, more. And I just added more slots, so check it out. Your first hint for August's entry is... Never Blue. Let's begin. What is a diamond? If you remember my earlier entries in this series, you may recall that diamonds are one of the four cardinal gemstones. A gemstone is any stone that can be cut and polished for jewelry. So even the dingiest jasper can be considered a gemstone, albeit a common one. But the four cardinal gemstones are the only ones considered precious. Diamond, ruby, sapphire, and emerald. Diamonds are the strongest naturally occurring terrestrial material that we know of. Not to oversimplify, but there are space diamonds that are harder, known as lonsdalite. That's funny. Diamonds are carbon arranged into a cubic atomic structure. Lonsdalite is also carbon, but with a hexagonal atomic structure, making it 58% harder than diamond. Previously theorized, it was only discovered in a meteorite, very recently. But again, as far as terrestrial objects are concerned, diamond is the hardest that is naturally occurring to date. The most scale of hardness, a scale used to help identify minerals, only goes to 10, with diamond sitting at the top. Diamonds can naturally occur in a wide variety of colors that are caused by various impurities that are worked into the various atomic structures themselves, with lilac arguably being the most rare. So how do they form? Deep in the mantle, and they are only brought to the surface via kimberlite pipes, lampro fires, eclogites, that's a fun one, and other rocks that originate deep in the Earth's mantle. Diamonds are also found in certain alluvial deposits and certain meteorites as well. The name itself is derived from the Greek word atomos, meaning invincible. And one of its earliest mentions comes from the Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder, who stated, Diamond is the most valuable, not only of precious stones, but of all things in the world. The world's love for diamonds began somewhere between the 4th and 2nd century BCE in India, but it wasn't until the late 1400s that diamonds made their way via trade routes to Europe and subsequently became fashion symbols for Europe's elite. By the 1700s, India's supply dwindled, but new finds in Brazil soon dominated the market. While sources changed, political upheavals and growing Western affluence broadened demand. By the 1800s, the first large South African deposit was unearthed. These deposits were perfectly timed for an even larger increase in demand. Which brings us to the part of the story where people sometimes do their best Mel Gibson impersonation. If you recall the first video in the series, our modern concept of birthstones arrived with Jewish gem traders making their way to Europe. It's likely these same traders were responsible for diamonds making their way to Europe. De Beers, the diamond company, was responsible for much of the mining in South Africa, and of the two men responsible for its establishment, Cecil Rhodes and Barney Bernardo, Barnado was born to a Jewish family. Several other Jewish firms also played roles in distribution. In the 1870s, annual diamond production was under 1 million carats annually. By the 1910s, it was around 3 million. By the 70s, it was 50 million. And by the 90s it passed 100 million carats annually. By the late 1980s, over 90% of all diamond production was funneled through De Beers. And because of this, there is a vocal minority that is utterly unhinged, but also pushing racial division for their own monetary gain. 
which is a very sad repeat of history. All of that aside though, there has been an equal amount of change in the diamond market from the 80s to today as there was in the or sorry, 1870s to 1980s. With new deposits in Botswana, Canada, and Australia, the supply is more robust than ever. De Beers itself has changed, greatly divesting its stewardship of the diamond supply. For instance, let's take a look at a recent article. This came out July 1st, 2023 via Reuters and is written by Clara Demina, sorry, Danina, and Brian Benza. De Beers has agreed to give Botswana more rough diamonds in new sales pact. I'll post the full article in the description, but the long and the short of it is that De Beers will eventually be increasing the amount of diamonds given to Botswana in their trade deal up to 50% by the end of the term as well as investing millions into, quote, enrichment programs. While not stated in this particular article, those enrichment programs were likely or will likely be in the form of cutting centers and educational opportunities. Essentially building up the market value of Botswana's own diamond dealers, so De Beers is taking less diamonds and building up what will likely be direct competition in the future, because you know as well as I do, eventually, once Botswana can do it on their own, they will cut De Beers out entirely. They just threatened to do it. The market is rapidly changing, which brings us to the unsavory topic, what is a blood diamond? Blood diamonds are also known as conflict diamonds. These are diamonds that are mined in war zones and typically fund insurgencies, terrorism, or warlord activities. And the uncomfortable truth is that there are more slaves today in the world, today, than at any other point in history. And some of those people are forced to mine against their will. If you want a diamond and want to avoid conflict diamonds, knowing where it came from is key. I've included a graphic of localities to keep an eye on. If you want a substitute, I'm a huge fan of moissanite instead of diamonds altogether. It's the crystalline form of silicon carbide and was first discovered in meteorites. What is on the market today is lab grown, but it makes a very affordable and durable alternative that looks extremely similar. So what are the uses for diamonds? The ancient Greeks and Romans believed that it would give them strong, invincible muscles, the biggest muscles. Whey protein and trend weren't invented yet. But diamonds hold rather interesting industrial applications and are now being used in computer chips and semiconductors. Diamonds are also used as abrasives and cutting material for mining and jewelry work. Diamonds are far more than just ornamental. As we conclude, I've also included an article detailing some of the largest diamonds ever found, and you can dig that up in the description as well. As always, if you like what I do here, please consider liking, commenting, subscribing, sharing if you so feel so inclined. But what are your thoughts on diamonds? Are they everything we believe them to be, or are they overhyped? Let me know in the comments, and thanks for watching.